The South American jungle is a forgotten world full of strange and mysterious animals. The Amerindians believe that a giant water dog lives here. The Spanish conquistadors thought a huge wolf had left the forest to rule the rivers. An unearthly wail proclaims the arrival of this king of the water world. It's the cry of a giant otter. The giant otter is the largest of its kind on Earth. A mature male can measure over eight feet, more than twice the length of its largest relative. It's also the world's rarest otter. Due to its great size and the velvet quality of its fur, its pelt was in great demand for coats and handbags in Europe during the early 1900s. Today, otters are fully protected, but the illegal trade continues. If a way isn't soon found to stop the demand for their fur, these majestic animals will be lost forever. The giant otter once ranged throughout Amazonian America, but loss of habitat, river pollution, and indiscriminate hunting have taken a heavy toll. They live in close family units of up to 30 individuals. But to see a large group like this one is a rare privilege today. Their bold and aggressive behavior makes them easy targets for hunters. There are probably no more than a thousand giant otters left, and they are only found in isolated areas of the South American interior. One of these is the Rupununi region in southwest Guyana. Guyana means land of many waters. The rainforest and savannas are crisscrossed by a network of rivers and creeks. Numerous rapids and waterfalls, such as Kai Tur, the longest single drop fall in the world, make the rivers unnavigable and keep man at bay. Giant otters have been exterminated in most of their former range. The Guyanas, Suriname, and isolated pockets of Peru are their last stronghold.
In Guyana, there are a handful of people who are deeply concerned about the otter's plight. Diane McTurk has a large ranch in the heart of the Rupununi Plains. She is struggling to protect the otters living on her land and devotes an increasing amount of time to rearing orphaned cubs. Every day she takes her cubs for a swim in the Rupununi River. She hopes that eventually these youngsters will return to the wild. In the meantime, she tries to be a surrogate mother, teaching them all the skills they will need in their natural environment. Come here, Miss. Come, Samira, where are you? Where is Samira? Come, you, come, you, my little baby, in my heart, my God. What you do? <laughs> Come baby. Come baby. I got that baby again. Come here, Rufus, baby. Come here, Rufus, and then. You what you want is your is your lunch. You want some lunch. Diane's grandparents were pioneer settlers. But the Makusi Indians have been here for thousands of years, and in all that time, they have coexisted with wildlife. Now, times have changed. They wear Western clothes, but in some ways live much as their ancestors did. Cassava, here being made into a local bread, and fish are still their staple diet. But foreigners have introduced new commodities, alcohol and tobacco being the most popular. Few Indians live off the land today. Many are employed by settlers, and they buy clothes, food and drink with their earnings. Money has changed their culture and way of life. It has given them a reason to kill rare wild animals and sell their pelts. But the otters also face a different threat from the Indians. Like people the world over, the Makusi are fond of keeping pets. Apart from dogs and cats, they also take in a variety of wild animals, including parrots, monkeys, and giant otters. Otter cubs are adorable, but difficult and demanding to rear. It's when the youngsters become sick or weak that the Indians tire of them and take them to Dian. The Indians illegally catch cubs to sell them. The people who buy the otters encourage them and further threaten the species. Even in capable hands, their chances are slim. Cubs are often weak or even dying by the time Diane takes them in. A suitable milk substitute is difficult to obtain in the jungle, as are antibiotics. Let us go. Let us go. Let us go, my love. Come, babies, come, creatures. Come, Jess. Neither of these baby otters is alive today. One died of an infection, and the other was clubbed to death by an Indian for chasing chickens. Come, Jess. Sleepy time, my darling. It is sleepy time. Giant otters rarely threaten livestock, but they do compete for fish and the Amerindians regard them as rivals. Fish is an important source of protein for the Makusi, and skilled fishermen are highly respected. Today, the Indians fish with a hook and a line. It's a simplified version of tackle introduced by the settlers. 
True to legend, South American rivers teem with piranha. Their reputation for stripping a man of his flesh in minutes makes them one of the most feared fish in the world. They are the only fish the Indians kill before retrieving their hook. Fingers are easily lost to their razor-edged teeth. The Makusi still use the traditional bow and arrow to hunt large fish and any other animal which comes within range. An otter pelt is worth $15 on the black market, the equivalent of two weeks' wages. Large webbed footprints are easy to track in the soft mud. The Makusi are some of the most skillful hunters in the world. They can move silently through the bush and sneak up on their quarry. An unexpected encounter with a peccary diverts their attention away from the otter. This South American wild pig is prized for its meat and is worth more to the Indians than an otter. The pig is lost to the river. The Indians are reluctant to wade into these piranha-infested waters. Activity upstream means the piranha are homing in along the blood trail. They don't totally deserve their fearsome reputation, and some of the stories about them are often pure fallacy. They approach with caution, but as soon as the carcass snags on a drowned tree, the fish close in. Within minutes, the water around the peccary is a mass of snapping jaws. In half an hour, the pig will be reduced to bones. In these piranha-infested waters, an aquatic mammal's chance of survival might seem slim. But contrary to popular belief, piranha usually only attack dead or dying animals. A healthy otter is too fast and agile. It's the fish which need to beware. They are among the giant otter's favorite prey. Although otters live in close family groups, they never share their catch. Instead, they guard it jealously, warning the others to keep their distance. This otter has caught a large black piranha, about two feet long and weighing about seven pounds. Like the Indians, otters handle these fish with caution. Prey are usually eaten head first, but a piranha's jaws are left until last. Small fish swarm round the feeding animal, scavenging for scraps. Each otter can consume about 20 pounds of fish every day. It's their enormous appetite which brings giant otters into conflict with man.
Piranha are bony and fiddly to eat, but they're plentiful and taste good. The rivers teem with fish, and predators like the giant otter have little effect on their numbers. Man, however, is beginning to upset the balance. The Indians now use nets to catch fish. These are effective, but undiscriminating and wasteful. These men have caught more than they need. Unpalatable species and fish spoiled in the sun are discarded. But when fish stocks fall, it's the otters who get the blame. The fishing expedition has not gone unnoticed. Vultures have an uncanny ability to spot a potential meal. Vultures have a sinister reputation as disposers of corpses, but they perform a vital role. By keeping the land clear of rotting flesh, they help to reduce the risk of disease. There are two common species in Guyana, the black vulture, which locates food by sight, and the more aggressive turkey vulture, which relies on its keen sense of smell. The squabbling birds and the smell of rotting fish attract the attention of one of the most formidable residents of these rivers, the black caiman. Caiman are South American alligators and can grow to over 18 feet long. This one is nearly full grown. They are reputed to be the fastest crocodiles in the world. They are quite capable of catching their own food, but will scavenge when the opportunity arises. It's hardly any wonder, with such large and ferocious neighbors, that otters have grown to Goliath proportions here. A distant caterwauling warns of an imminent intrusion, and the caiman sink below the surface. For sheer speed and agility, even these huge reptiles cannot challenge the giant otter for supremacy in the underwater world. It's February, 
there's been no rain for three months. The Rupununi savannas and the flooded forest have almost dried out. A few isolated pools dotted over the plains are the only wet areas left. As the water level drops, the fish become concentrated in the ponds, and the otters are quick to exploit this superabundance of food. They search for fish sheltering beneath the lily pads, which, like the otters, come in giant proportions here. Some of the leaves are over six feet across. Giant otters are diurnal and hunt mainly by sight. But in muddy water, they rely heavily on their sensitive whiskers, detecting prey by the slightest movement. Like otters worldwide, they are particularly fond of eels. There are red piranha trapped here too. Replete, the otters relax in the shallows. Play is the privilege of animals fortunate enough not to have to seek food all their waking hours. Surrounded by a captive larder, the otters have plenty of spare time. The otters are not alone in exploiting this surfeit of trapped food. Several species of kingfisher fly in to join the feast. This is an immature Amazon kingfisher. When the water is no more than a few inches deep, great flocks of egrets, storks and ibis gather at the receding edges of the ponds. It's a time of plenty. Fish stranded in the shallow water make easy picking. When there are no fish left, the birds will fly on to another shrinking pool. The otters, meanwhile, head back to the river, traveling along trails made by forest animals. On land, the giant otter is cumbersome and vulnerable to attack from its only natural enemy, the jaguar.
This large cat is South America's ultimate predator and will kill any animal which comes within range. High in the canopy, a tyra is safely out of reach. The Indians call this animal the tree otter. It looks similar and is closely related to the giant otter. Both species belong to the weasel family. But the tyra is at home in the treetops and rarely ventures to the water's edge. The jaguar moves on to hunt more accessible prey. The agouti is a denizen of the forest floor, where it searches for fallen fruit. This large rodent is hunted by wildcats, bush dogs, and also by Indians. Little wonder that it's wary of the slightest sound. But a giant otter is no cause for alarm. It's too slow and noisy to catch an agouti, and its prime concern is to hurry back to the safety of the river. The creek water is tea-colored, stained by acids leaching from rotting leaves. Once in the water, an otter is again in its element moving with consummate grace. The giant otter has a bold and extremely inquisitive nature. A 20-foot anaconda is quite capable of constricting and swallowing an animal the size of this otter. Nonetheless, it has to be investigated. Like a mongoose, the otter is quick enough to keep out of striking distance. It will eat small snakes, but this is surely a little over-ambitious. Curiosity satisfied, the otter moves on. The water level in the river can drop 20 feet by the end of the dry season. Sandbanks appear, cutting off scores of fish 
and leaving them trapped in the shallows. The otters are quick to take advantage. The pools serve as a nursery for baby caiman. There's plenty of fish to eat, but with little cover, these reptiles are vulnerable to predators, including the giant otter. Caiman are evidently good to eat, but they're tricky to catch. They have needle-sharp teeth, which can penetrate even an otter's thick pelt. The caiman puts up a brave fight, but a foot-long reptile is no match for a seven-foot otter. But most of the caiman will survive. They are just not worth the effort. Even piranha are an easier option. When giant otters are not fishing or sleeping, they're invariably playing. They pair for life. Play reinforces this partnership and they become virtually inseparable. Giant otters are extremely vocal. In fact, they are the world's noisiest otter, with an extraordinary repertoire from snorts, huffs, and sneeze-like grunts to loud, penetrating screams and wails. Each family claims its own stretch of river usually between two and four kilometers. Within their territory, the otters excavate a number of chambers in the river bank, known as holts. Here they rest during the day and sleep at night. Giant otters go to great lengths to scent mark their territory with urine and strong smelling droppings called spraint. There's always a sprain site near each holt, usually on the bank above it. The scent informs other giant otters that the area is occupied and probably enables them to determine the owner's age, sex and breeding condition. Giant otters have been known to breed at any time of the year, but most cubs are born during the dry season. When the river is low, the breeding holt is unlikely to be flooded, and with the fish concentrated in the river, there's no shortage of food. These cubs are six weeks old. Their eyes have opened, but like all babies, they still need a lot of sleep.
They are sufficiently independent to be left alone for short periods, but their parents return every few hours to check on their well-being. It's at about this age that the adults decide to introduce their offspring to the world outside. One parent surveys the river first to make sure that there are no jaguar or passing Indians nearby. Both might take the babies. Only when it is sure the coast is clear does it return to collect its young. The adults confidently enter the water and head upstream, encouraging their cubs to follow. But for a baby otter, the river is a strange new world where the unknown lurks round every corner. Finding themselves alone, the adults pause for a while, waiting for their young to catch up. But otter cubs are not the water babies one might expect. The river is cold comfort after the warmth of the holt, and the cubs are very reluctant to get their feet wet. They seem torn between fear and the desire to follow their parents. After a great deal of persuasion, the youngsters make it to the water's edge, and that, it seems, is quite far enough. But no amount of enticing or bullying will lure the cubs into the river just yet. It could be days before they'll finally take the plunge. But speed is of the essence. A distant rumble signals an end to the drought. The otter cubs must be able to swim before the flood. Clouds roll in from the Atlantic Ocean, laden with moisture.
The rain falls gently at first, enveloping the forest in veils of mist. It's but a brief interlude before a storm. The mood is one of celebration, as the rains refresh the land and replenish the river. Within a few days, the banks are splashed with color, exotic hues found only in the tropics. Orchids are common here. These are epiphytic species, which means they use trees for support but take no nourishment from them. During the rains, the rivers burst their banks, flooding the forest and surrounding savanna. The fish migrate back into the flooded forest to feed and spawn, and the otters pursue them. For the next four months, the otters return into this impenetrable jungle where they are beyond the reach of man and free at last from persecution. The Rupununi region is still a bastion for the giant otter. But 50 miles away, across the border in Brazil, the otter population has been decimated by hunting and habitat destruction. A new road is being built from Boa Vista in Brazil to the coast of Guyana. This will pave the way for hunters, fur traders, and foresters. Very soon now, this sanctuary for the giant otter could become yet another killing field. As in all South American forests, the chainsaw has replaced the axe. A forest giant, which may have taken 200 years to grow, can now be felled in as many seconds.
logging is still limited in Guyana. But the world is greedy for wood and the government needs the revenue. Habitat destruction and river pollution follow. The giant otter needs all the health it can get. Deanne McTurk's efforts will have little effect on the world population of this beautiful creature. But at least the groups which live on her ranch have a chance of survival. You had enough swimming and you wanted eating. You had enough swimming and you wanted eating. Last year, Diane successfully released two adult females into the wild. During the rains, like the rest of their kin, they disappeared into the tangled forest. Five months later, Diane was told that both animals had been killed. But two months afterwards, she was thrilled when both otters returned, hungry but healthy. They haven't yet learned to fear people, and it is remarkable they are still thriving. It means that the local Indians are listening to Diane and beginning to respect her. More remarkable still, the females returned with two unknown males. The males tolerate their mates' bewildering behavior for short periods, but then appear to call them back to the wild. The latest news is one of the females has given birth to two cubs. Diane is trying to persuade the Guyanese government to designate this region of the Rupununi as a wildlife reserve. It may only be a tiny fragment of their former range, but it is just large enough to offer protection and hope for the giant otter. <laughs> 